Good evening. I am David Rowe, Director of the Center for the Study of American Democracy here at Kenyon. This fall, the Center, in conjunction with the Office of Alumni and Parent Engagement, is sponsoring a series of six online panels that examine the question, is the American experiment still viable? We do so by drawing on the deep reservoir of Kenyan alumni, parents, faculty, and friends actively engaged in America's democratic life. Tonight, I am pleased to welcome you to the fifth panel in our series, Information, Misinformation, Disinformation. Before we get started, please let me thank the many people who made this evening possible. These include Lindsay Colopy, Adam Gilson, Annie Gordon, and Kent Woodward Ginther from the offices of Alumni and Parent Engagement, Communications and Advancement. I also thank Andrea Lechleitner and Professor Nancy Powers from the Center for the Study of American Democracy, along with the Center's student associates, Owen Fitzgerald, class of 22, Rose Fisher, class of 22, James Henderson, class of 23, and Max Onazorg, class of 21. Brittany Balo of Kenyon's Library and Information Services provided technical support. Finally, I thank the many alumni, faculty, parents, and friends of the college whom we consulted as we put this program together. Civic dialogue lies at the core of democratic life. To be a self-governing people requires that we possess the ability to speak freely with one another about the public issues that concern us most. And through our conversations, that we build common knowledge about the nature of the world we live in and the challenges that it presents that we deliberate and weigh various ways to address these challenges, and ultimately that we are able to articulate our views and desires to the democratically elected officials whom we empower to act on our behalf. Thus, it is no coincidence that the first article in the Bill of Rights by holding that, quote, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, establishes the essential infrastructure necessary for civic dialogue and self-government to exist. By holding that we must be free to discuss any issue that arises as a matter of a concern, no matter how difficult or controversial or unpopular, the freedom of speech establishes the context of our civic dialogue and demands that it must be unbounded. By holding that we may publicize our ideas, beliefs, and concerns without legal interference or censure, and so ensure that others may hear what we think and respond in kind, the freedom of the press provides the protected public space necessary for open, transparent, civic dialogue to take place. Equally essential to self-government, these freedoms also serve as a fundamental check on power, both by those who would use the power of government to subdue us and by those who would use the power of language to mislead or deceive us. The freedoms of speech and the press guarantee our ability to speak truth to power, while deep and probing civic conversations ensure that truth will ultimately win out over deception and falsehood. In short, it is free speech and a free press, and not Congress, the president, or the judiciary that fundamentally enable and protect democratic life and self-government. Without these two freedoms, our government would still continue to function. It just wouldn't be democratic. We recognize the critical importance of these two freedoms to democratic life when we refer to the press and the media more generally as the fourth estate of American democracy. So it is only natural to ask at a time when American democracy seems itself to hang in the balance, how well is the fourth estate doing in promoting the engaged civic dialogue upon which democracy so fundamentally depends? And the answer can be summed up in four simple words, not well at all. All. The challenges confronting the fourth estate are legion. They range from a hostile administration that actively seeks to delegitimize any outside effort to hold it to account by labeling those efforts simply as fake news, to the willingness of some media outlets to act as propaganda arms of the administration, to a changing business environment that blurs the boundaries between news and entertainment, to the emergence of social media platforms that enable the siloing of information and the creation of echo chambers in ways that impede true civic dialogue. To the decimation of local media outlets and the emergence of a media landscape dominated by a few national players who at times even seek to set for themselves the terms of our civic dialogue. 
and ultimately to a loss of public faith in the media's ability to accurately hear or convey the public's concerns, much less be independent, autonomous, or objective in their reporting. To help us think through the role of the fourth estate in American democracy and the many deep and complex challenges that it now confronts, I am pleased to introduce tonight's panel. This evening's panel will be moderated by Matt Winkler, class of 77, parent class of 13, and who received an honorary degree from Kenyon in 2000. Matt is a co-founder and the editor emeritus of Bloomberg News. His work has been honored by an Emmy Lifetime Achievement Award, the Gerald Loeb Foundation Lifetime Achievement Award, and a Pulitzer Prize. Matt began his career in journalism at the Kenyon Collegian and the Mount Vernon News. James Blue, parent class of 23, is the senior content and special projects producer for PBS NewsHour. He has received numerous awards for his journalism, including the Walter Cronkite Award for Excellence in Television Political Journalism, eight Emmys, two Overseas Press Club Awards, two Alfred I. DuPont Columbia Awards, and a National Association of Black Journalists Award for Overall Excellence. Devon Maharaj, parent class of 19 and class of 22, is a former editor-in-chief at the Los Angeles Times. His career as a journalist has, sp has spanned several countries and continents. His investigative series, Living on Pennies, was honored with the 2005 Ernie Pyle Award for Human Interest Writing. Adam Rubenstein, class of 17, is a member of the opinion staff at the New York Times. He has also written for the Wall Street Journal and the Weekly Standard, and like Matt Winkler, began his career as a journalist at the Kenyon Collegian. Mm -hmm. Jerry Tucker, class of 74, runs Tucker Multimedia, an advertising consulting company. Before that, she was deputy managing editor at USA Today, and before that, the former managing editor for the Midwest for Gannett News Service. In addition, she has been a reporter for the Do Detroit pre Press and the Akron Beacon Journal. Please note tonight that the panelists are speaking in their personal capacities only and may at times be unable to answer some questions. The panel will converse for about 40 minutes and then take questions from the audience for another 40 to 45. You may post questions in the chat accompanying the YouTube stream. We also ask too that the participants in the chat please identify themselves by their real names as this is a way of helping to maintain a constructive civic dialogue. We will try to answer as many of your questions as possible, but may not take them in order as a way to maintain the flow of conversation. Please note too that our intention tonight is not a partisan debate or the scoring of partisan points, but rather to strive for a constructive probing and civic discussion that takes others seriously and seeks to generate greater understanding about the consequential forces at play in American democracy at this time. Our hope is that we all come away knowing more about this topic. With that, please let me hand things over to Matt to moderate this evening's panel. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rowe, uh, Jerry, James, Davon, and Adam. It's great to be with you and a privilege to be with the greater Kenyan community for this special event. As Professor Rowe said, this is about information, misinformation, and disinformation. That's our focus in what many say is probably the most important presidential election of our time. Here's where we were at this point four years ago. The Washington Post released the tape from Access Hollywood, a show owned by NBC Universal, in which Donald Trump recounted his exploits with women that many lawyers and commentators said was sexual assault. NBC somehow had overlooked this bombshell until it was everybody's news. That story on October 5th buried the report on the same day from the Department of Homeland Security that Russia interfered in 2016 to support Trump. A week later, the director of the FBI, James Comey, in an unprecedented move a little more than a week before the November election, said he was opening another investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails after saying, no crimes were committed in July. Her emails received far more page one coverage from media in 2016, especially the New York Times, than Trump's six bankruptcies as a failed businessman, his refusal to release his tax returns, 
and has 3,500 legal cases in state and federal courts. CNN's Jake Tapper repeatedly reminded viewers that Clinton and Trump were equivalent as the most unpopular candidates running for president, inferring they were opposite sides of the same coin. Reporting Trump's victory often failed to mention that Clinton received almost 3 million more votes in only the fifth election in American history when the loser of the popular vote was inaugurated. James, given what you do for a living and how important it is, is the press any smarter, any better today than it was four years ago? Uh, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be a uh, part of this conversation. Um, you know, I think we are much smarter and I think we are much more careful about how we are characterizing um, this election. I will say four years ago, Judy Woodruff and I went out to spend the weekend, uh, the weekend um, before the last weekend. So it was Halloween weekend. We went out and went to one Clinton event and we went to one Trump event. The Clinton event was in a high school gymnasium and the Trump event was in a, um, was in a big hotel ballroom in um, Las Vegas and people were dressed in costume. And just the energy, you cannot, I mean, we should have known, you cannot win an election holding events in high school gymnasia or auditoria at the end of October, if that is sort of your measure of how many people you're attracting. And so what's happening now is there are lots of polls showing uh, President Biden or Vice President Biden is doing really well. And you have a number of us journalists asking our pollster friends on both sides, is this really happening? Is this really happening? Um, there was a really big scare today a report that President Trump's campaign has pulled all of their advertising down in Florida. And we did not report this, it's not exactly true. And what it looks like has happened is that they have redirected some funds that they were spending directly to both the state and the National Republican Party. And so is that an indicator of something? Who knows? But I think we are much, much more cautious, much, much more careful and even how we're framing what November 3rd is. November 3rd is not election day. It is the end of voting day. And if you look at the number of Americans who voted thus far, we have to frame it that way such that people will understand we may have a result on um, Tuesday night, but we may not. But we want to try to frame it within the context of a lot of other things that have happened, including voting on that day. But certainly as we have approached this election, we have chosen only to go with the Associated Press and their election calls. A number of networks, a number of organizations are doing their own decision-making. PBS doesn't have the resource to support that, but it's really, I think, put a, it's dampened our approach. And we are much more skeptical and we're asking a lot more questions. And today, you know, I was speaking to our White House reporter. Joe Biden was in Georgia. Kamala Harris is going to Texas. Democratic candidates going to places where Democrats haven't won in a very long time is really, really strange. And so it's our job to point out to our audience that this is strange, uh, which is what we did tonight and what we will do when Harris makes it to uh, Texas to, on Thursday. So, Davon, James says at this point, as you just heard, the press, certainly PBS, is much more cautious about how it goes about reporting everything said and done in the context of the election. But what about the perception of the press, um, which is often, if not typically, defined in a partisan context? If we just take a look at, for example, so many of the Pew uh, surveys, the polling 
on how the public perceives the press. And I'm quoting from one that uh, arrived uh, at our doorstep at the end of last year. On item after item, Republicans consistently express far greater skepticism of the news media and their motives than Democrats, according to this analysis. It focuses on trust in the uh, news media during 2018 and 19, and I dare say it's probably no different in 2020. So you have this uh, widening gap, if you will, between Republicans who distrust this, you know, the press, um, certainly many of the media that uh, all of the panelists represent, and then the Democrats who have a very different view. So what do you make of all this, and yeah. particularly in the context of what James is talking about? Yeah, thanks, Matt, and thanks for including me in, among this really esteemed panel. Um, I'm, you know, I'm honored to be part of it. Um, um, just going back a little well, bit. Well, you represent the uh, fifth largest economy <laughs> in the world, so how could we not include you? Going back to James's answer, I, I totally agree with James, and I'd like to, ch if, I, if I may, Matt, I'd like to change the question in a bit. It, it, the question is, if we, we smarter, I think we are more aware, and we, we are more aware that we could be wrong, right, that we could get it wrong. Um, um, back in the days when I was at the LA Times. We have, our poll suggested that Trump could win. Maybe it was the only one. Um, but at the same time, Hillary still won the um, the popular vote, right? But uh, we saw something happening, especially in some places in the West, which we sought to capture by a series of story called Trump Nation, and we sent cartoonists, reporters um, to Trump's rallies and. Um, Trump friendly place, places where he was making inroads to try to find out what was behind the energy. And we found that a lot of the people who supported Trump and voted for him and probably didn't vote before, they were victims, for want of a better word, of the 2008 financial um, crash and crisis. Um, and they were railing against what they perceived as the establishment. So just to, just to, um, I wanted to just say that in addition to James's um, really um, cool answer. Now also coming back to your question on perception, I think it's very clear to that why there's a, uh, why the, we are living in such a polarized times with regard to the press. Um, Trump has made it very clear that the great thing about him is that you really don't have to guess um, what what's behind his actions. He actually tells you almost every time. And in more than one interview, he told people that I'm going to call you fake news and I'm going to try, these are my words, not his, I'm going to try to delegitimize you. So when you write stuff about me, I can say that it's fake news, right? And if you look at that Pew study, it's very clear that people who, tr who support Trump are very critical um, and untrusting of the media, right? Um, people who think well about their communities and people who think well of the, the press, they are, they're usually not Trump supporters, but people who support Trump buy into his narrative that the press is um, not trustworthy, corrupt, and everything that Trump say they are. So I think, I, I'm not sure, maybe the Pew people can tell us, or if you dig into the Pew, Pew studies, but I'm not sure um, there has ever been a time where the polar, polarization and um, has been so strong with regard to how Democrats view the press and how Republicans view the press. And it's all because um, of... A Trump, no, rather. No. Yeah, well, and in that, uh, in that vein, Jerry, um, part of the problem, if you will, of this growing divide is the hollowing out of the press itself. I mean, if you think of uh, the newspaper industry where you are um, a seasoned veteran, uh, there are fewer and fewer people working in newspapers every day. Um, and that trend shows no signs of uh, 
abating. And at the same time, the people who are defining what's news are often without the traditional skill sets that you, of course, uh, have uh, had all your career. So uh, how do we get to where James wants us to be with so many newsrooms in convulsion and also uh, a shadow of their former selves? That's a question for me. That's, I was going to ask Jerry. I that think that's, a, that's all right. <laughs> I think that's a great question, Matt. Thank you for including me in this conversation. Um, I wanted to go back a moment, though, because I wanted to address the question you asked initially. Has the media gotten smarter? And I'm of the opinion that, no, the media has not gotten smarter. Um, and it's, it's a very complicated issue. Um, part of it is driven by what you were referring to as the hollowing out of newsrooms, both in print and in uh, digital and, and vi video media, uh, broadcast media. Um, there was a huge wave of change over the past decade as um, sort of the traditional profit model for newspapers disappeared. I guess it's been over two decades. Um, and the curtain was pulled back on um, what advertisers wanted, what news organizations could actually deliver and how digital kind of changed it all and advertisers could suddenly target audiences better. And so the news media had to find new ways of delivering content that was able to bring in some revenue. And so a lot of them migrated more to the digital platform as advertisers pulled out their dollars from traditional print and broadcast media. You saw the rise of the news channels. You saw the rise of digital platforms, the streaming services, of social media uh, becoming the news of choice for some people. And what's happened is that um, I think the people in general are even more skeptical of media than they were even when that Pew study was done because they don't know who, who to listen to. Um, they don't know if a story is driven by the number of clicks it can get. Um, the idea of the public trust that traditional broadcasts and news media used to hold has really eroded. Um, there's concern that new um, venues have come into the media framework. Um, people get their news from um, Bill Maher as often as they get it from the New York Times sometimes. So I think it's become a confused landscape and it's one in which uh, people like Donald Trump who has defaulted to Twitter has been able to create his own news as no longer sort of in the hands of traditional news media, but with a tweet, he can create what is the news agenda of the day as opposed to traditional news organizations, which kind of set the news agenda of what was going to be the top stories. So it's become more confused. And I'm not sure that traditional news media, as they've lost people, uh, as they've um, had to go through layoffs, and um, a lot of the senior writers and editors and reporters have been replaced by young new people with great digital skills, but maybe not the seasoned background that was expected or was present before. I don't, I'm not sure that they're really controlling um, the situation as best they could. So in that context, um, Jerry, um, especially relates to our title, which is misinformation, disinformation after information. And some people might wonder about those three words. Well, we all know what information is, uh, but there is a difference between misinformation and disinformation. Uh, disinformation is when you know for a fact that 
something is false and uh, is erroneous. And in this digital space that we're in today, you know, uh, truth in the age of Twitter is obviously a casualty uh, because there's so much misinformation and disinformation uh, coming at us at the same time as we're getting in, in, we're getting the information. And when when we all started, when I say we, Jerry, yours truly, I dare say uh, James and uh, Davon, uh, the three most important words in journalism were accuracy, accuracy, and accuracy. So we we've uh, come very far from that. Uh, Adam, you are uh, here's hoping uh, our hope for the future. So uh, how do we get out of this? Yes. Or do uh, we get out of it? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so first, I should just reiterate what David said, that every, everything I say here, at least, uh, and I assume for others, is our own voice and not the voice of the institutions uh, we work for. Um, and second, thank you for including me. Um, the uh, How do we get out of this is an interesting question. I think I agree with Jerry on uh, just about everything she said. Um, I think the problems are uh, far more institutional. Um, they have to do with, um, you know, reporters from the coasts parachuting in and telling a story from, um, you know, a diner in some, you know, small community somewhere, not actually um, knowing much about the community that they're reporting on and uh, sort of giving a picture um, for elite consumption uh, of um, a, an America that's, that's, um, distinctly not uh, what, you know, somebody on the coast would think is elite or, you know, that's really a broad brush, but uh, I think you're, you're picking up what I'm putting down. Um, I think the, uh, the, the, another consideration is kind of like, what is a newsroom um, and, and who fits in? So um, is it simply, um, you know, the credentialed, um, the, you know, the, um, Yale graduates, uh, small liberal arts college graduates uh, from Kenyan, or is it, does it include people whose perspectives might come from outside of academia and uh, give a, a different impression of, you know, the way things work that's, um, you know, maybe just as rigorous um, as, as it would be through, um, through academia, but um, through, um, you know, just shoe leather reporting. Um, and I mean, that, that's a bit, you know, um, that might seem a bit out there, um, but I think a lot of the mistakes that are made um, come from uh, this sort of sense of overachieving, uh, of overachievement that we have. Um, I see a lot of reporters um, reporting at elite institutions from Twitter, really. I mean, if we think to how uh, the Covington Catholic uh, story was reported, it was really reported from from Twitter and, and not from what was actually happening there. And that um, sort of reinforces this cycle of, um, of, of really misinformation. Um, and you know, that ends with uh, lawsuits and um, all sorts of um, different feelings directed at those with you know, MAGA hats and you know, uh, protesters on the mall um, from different groups. So, um, one, one thing might be, uh, one thing that might help, uh, newsrooms is simply ban Twitter, um, or don't let your, your, um, your employees tweet, um, they can use it to research, but, but maybe, uh, as a, as a reporting tool, um, embedding tweets, putting them up on CNN, um, it's effective. And, you know, the president makes such, such ample use of Twitter, um, but maybe, engaging in this uh, feedback loop isn't what's best for the, the spread of information. So what I'm hearing from you, Adam, is, uh, if I may paraphrase, more signals, less noise. And where are the signals? And um, in that context, I want to come back to you, uh, Davon, because you said uh, I think you said Trump's goal is to delegitimize the press. Um, is he doing that in order to destroy freedom of the press? Well, um, he hasn't said so yet, but I think it's having a corrosive, a corrosive effect, as we can tell from the, from the Pew study on, on the media and how people believe the media. 
But I think his, his really short term goal is, um, is really to make sure that when the press, this is when, did, when we do the big investigative stories on him, that, that the, the cycle on those stories are very short. I mean, if you look at the excellent work, the New York Times and, and the Wall Street Journal um, and the Washington Post and, and your whole shop, uh, Matt, they've done on the press and the presidency and his, and his holdings and his, um, frankly, corrupt acts, if I can say so. Um, it's, Trump was elected in spite of the great journalism that happened, but, you know, Trump is a very target, what we would call a, a target rich topic for investigative journalism. And we've seen, especially over the last three years, the press, um, the media have broken incredible amounts of, you know, great stories that would sink any president, right? But I, I'm always, I'm, I'm glad you posed this question. I'm happy you posed this question to me, Matt, because I'm always looking at how long is this going to last and what is he going to do today or say today that is going to send, um, you know, the networks in another direction. And almost always that happens. He says something ridiculous. He, um, he says something outrageous and, you know, uh, throws, he throws breadcrumbs here and, the, you know, the press just run to it. So something like the, the fact that he paid $750 in taxes two years in a row, right? Or the fact that the first lady said, who gives a, a what about Christmas, you know? I mean, can you imagine Obama or any other president saying that and the, what would happen, right? So, um, to, I mean, to answer your question directly, yes, he tries to we could say delig delegitimize discredit, but whatever he's, he's doing has had, has made millions of people believe that the press is, is not, should not be trusted. And I don't think you wake up, you know, after election day in case, just in, let's just for argument's sake, say we, say we have a new president and turn a switch and that's gonna change. And I think you're gonna have to have a way through media literacy or through, you know, um, other efforts to, to, for the press to get back some of that um, credit. And, and, I, and I just want to add, um, sorry, Matt, the Obama administration was not the friendliest group to journalists. I think Correct. they conducted more leak investigations than any previous uh, administration. And our colleague, James Reston, really recognizes because he was prosecuted for his involvement in some of the cases that they were very upset about. So yes, it is very difficult as Devon has said to you know, sort of close that door or to put that genie back in the bottle. But I think it would be a mistake for us to think that the Trump administration is you know, at the head of this. Um, I think going to Adam's point about I think there are two points that he made that I think are interesting. The first is the, the whole issue with Twitter. I've worked in a number of news organizations from you know, NBC, ABC, BET, Discovery. I've never worked in a place where the president refused to give a network anchor an interview. And so not having access to go sit down with the president, you are left with using things that he does communicate and he does communicate with Twitter. And so we have chosen when on occasion it works to use his tweets as statements of fact, policy or whatever, they are coming from the president. The other thing that um, Adam mentioned is looking at who we are doing what we do and the ways in which our credibility may not be as strong with the public because of what we look like, the way we've trained, the way we communicate and sort of where we are. I think those are really big challenges. Um, one of the ways that we are trying to address that challenge is by trying to hire journalists from around the country who can contribute to our newsroom based in places other than Washington DC where we're headquartered. I think one of the opportunities of the COVID crisis is that it's let us recognize that people can work quite effectively remotely. 
And so we've just sort of taken that on the next level, trying to figure out how can we bring people into our news ecosystem who might be working in local communities, might be doing things in a different way than we are doing them, and how do we find and use that value and that reporting into what we are doing. The last thing I would say, again, based on what Adam was talking about, how do we situate ourselves in ways that we are somehow closer to the experience of the people we happen to cover? I happen to be a Christian. I go to church generally every Sunday when it's possible. Uh, I happen to have been adopted. You know, my parents happen to have been Southerners who were able to, you know, spend time in the North, get educated, and come back. All of these things define me. I happen to be gay. I happen to be a parent. And I think one of the challenges in the systems that we create in our newsrooms, there generally tend to be a lot of sameness. And I think the extent to which we are able to break that down and create and hire and support and promote people who aren't like us, I think that adds to the lacking credibility. I mean, I think one of the things, that's the last thing I'll say, when I first went to work at NBC, whenever I spoke to my grandmother who lived in rural North Carolina, people would just sort of look at me because immediately I would get a Southern accent. Having a Southern accent and using it should not be a surprising factor in a newsroom. And the fact that it was is an indicator of the work that needs to be done to try to make sure who we are is in better alignment with the country that we're trying to cover. You know, uh, you're uh, so far among us, probably the most encouraging and uh, dare I say optimistic, if I can use that word about uh, the future of the press. In that vein, um, do you think we've come a long way since when Ronald Reagan announced his candidacy for president in the deepest part of Mississippi? And most of the journalists who were covering him at the time probably looked and sounded like me, right? And didn't pick up on what was going on back then. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, look, I think it is a fair characterization. Um, but I also think, you know, things have certainly progressed. I mean, we're sitting here having, a, you know, a conversation. Can it go further? Absolutely. But has there been progress? For sure. And it, but I think the progress has been somewhat limited. It's, it's an, look, should there be more people of color? Should there be more women? Absolutely. At the same time, should there be people who are from different regions of the country, people who are first generation, you know, college graduates, um, people who possibly haven't graduated from college? I mean, I've been, as we begin to think about hiring journalists from across the country, I've been speaking to a lot of people. And there are some people who run news services via WhatsApp. And so the question for me is, how do I take or if we were to hire someone, how do you harness that person's reporting ability and their insight in how to reach his or her community? How do you harness that and use it within an organization like PBS NewsHour? Should you try to use that within a way uh, for something like PBS NewsHour? That person has a lot of credibility. Think of the personal nature of a WhatsApp, major, WhatsApp message versus Judy Woodruff sitting at the anchor desk telling you something. Who do you think people are going to believe more? Someone who comes on your phone as a WhatsApp or someone who comes to you over the TV or in a newspaper or what have you? And so, yes, I do think we are constantly trying to move and we have to evolve. And if we don't, then the audience is going to judge us to be frauds. So, Adam, I'd like to pick up on that last point, which is uh, Judy Rudra, uh, for many of us, is an institution uh, that we've lived with all our lives um, as journalists. 
Um, I suspect for you, not so much. And James raises a point, which is, you know, is she still relevant um, in the age of Twitter? Um, so uh, I'll start by saying that I love Judy Woodruff and I watch Shields and Brooks every Friday. Um, but, um, you know, I'm probably the only person my age. Um, I think uh, David Brooks has a joke that um, he's when he's at an airport and there's uh, an 80 year old uh, lady walks up to him and says, I love your show. I see you every Friday night. Um, and my mother does too. Um, her, mo his, her mother is uh, the demographic that, that, um, that they're speaking to. Um, I think, uh, you know, my, my generation looks at, uh, looks at Substack and these new platforms um, sort of as, um, an escape from uh, the traditional uh, confines, um, the, away from the gatekeepers uh, that we've seen. I think they still, we've relied on rather. I, I, kind, of, um, I kind of think media is consolidating and you're gonna have um, really, you know, three or four main publications, uh, you know, the Journal, the Post, the Times, Bloomberg. Um, uh, and then uh, everything sort of um, in on cable um, will will fight it out uh, between streaming ser uh, services and um, and what you know the future of of uh, cord cutting is I think um, something you know PBS James must be uh, concerned concerned with um, but uh, I, th I I think generally um, things are trending more towards um, uh, democratization of media and, and kind of what's true and what's, what can be um, disseminated, what is disseminated um, uh, numerically, but um, as it relates to publications, you know, the big four publications I, I said, um, it's narrowing what, um, what is said in, inside those publications and they're really trying to um, draw the line of uh, what's, um, what's true. You, you, the, the rise of fact check journalism uh, lately is, is one of the hot, um, you know, it, it's, you know, viewed, um, it gets a lot of clicks and interest and people ask for it repeatedly. Um, where's the fact check for this? So I think um, there's, uh, at least in my generation, there's a, a hunger for um, new uh, modes of obtaining news. And so, you know, Twitter fills, fills that pretty nicely. So does Nuzzle. Um, uh, there are a bunch of other apps and, and platforms, but um, the consolidation at the top and the democratization at the bottom has led to a system where we're really not on the same page anymore uh, with, with what we're uh, reading. So uh, that, that's, a, that's a question that will be solved far above my pay grade. Um, but it's a, it's a big problem. Matt, can I just so, jump in here? Yeah, for, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, because I think Adam uh, makes some interesting points. And what um, Devon was saying, uh, I'm sorry, what James was saying about reaching out beyond the sort of traditional people we go to making, going after diversity in a different way strikes me as kind of um, back to the future in the sense that in, I remember when I got into journalism back in the seventies that at the Akron Beacon Journal, there were lots of stringers throughout the counties surrounding Akron um, who were there to help report the news and reflect the communities they lived in. Um, and they were paid, you know, I don't know, you know, some minimum amount, but they were sort of the authentic voices out there so that the Beacon Journal could be more of a representative um, newspaper for the community it covered, knowing that the staff reporters couldn't do it alone. So if that's happening out there, if NPR and others are really sort of reaching out to beyond the traditional ranks of uh, journalists and really going into communities and listening and um, getting information from those people, I think that could help a lot and sort of 
reflecting the country better in the news that we report uh, and give more credibility to the big players. I agree with Adam that, you know, it's papers like the New York Times and the Washington Post, Bloomberg and others who have the dollars to invest in larger reporting staffs and greater resources that at the top will probably continue to dominate. But if they can dominate and also reflect better the community, the country that they serve, as opposed to sort of parachuting in and trying to reflect a community viewpoint that they don't really understand, I think we might gain, make some gains in terms of credibility, increasing the credibility of the media. You know, Jerry, that gets back to your original point um, at the outset of this discussion, which is given the economics of media today, to what extent is the press lost its perspective, maybe even lost its discipline to pursue the facts as they lead them in a chase for readership or eyeballs? And that's really a question for everybody here, um, because it it gets at the bigger question, which is, you know, how does one um, operate successfully um, and at the same time uh, without bias? Um, you know, there there are people in our um, community who are sending us questions, and one of them is, you know, which media outlets, for example, are doing the best job living up to the expectations of a free press. Um, according to the First Amendment, although I think if we went there, we would go back to the Aurora and find that the press was everything it, it wanted to be, uh, for better, for worse. But I really think this is a question for all of you. Matt, I would just like to jump in with a slight, you know, to, to broaden the issue a bit, because, you know, we talk about, you know, perspective and, you know, serving the public, but mainly from a national perspective. But what we haven't discussed is the fact that we have a crisis of the media in the United States right now, where we have thousands of communities, you know, without any journalists. We have state houses now um, that go uncovered. Oh, they just, they have maybe a, the smallest number of reporters. Um, in the last 15 years or so, we've lost about 2000 newspapers, you know, um, newspapers have closed down. Um, granted, most of them were a lot of them were weeklies. But even this week, the Salt Lake Tribune um, announced that they were becoming a weekly because they can no longer support, you know, a daily operation. So, um, and the fact that you have no gatekeepers, watchdogs in these communities anymore, that has uh, consequences all the way down to how we vote. Um, you know, it, it might sound elitist, so you could probably help me clean up my language here, but in the last election, the 50 most educated cities, communities voted for Hillary Clinton, the 50 least educated voted for um, Donald Trump. Um, we can draw whatever, uh, whatever you know, um, inferences we want from that, but the fact is that you know, we could we could talk about the networks and um, the New York Times and MSNBC and stuff, but at the end of the day, we have a crisis where we no longer have the, the journalism world that we all grew up in, where we no longer had the reporter on the ground. We no longer have the reporter on the ground. We no longer, you know, in California, they have all of these vast news deserts. And if you a place places like Oakland and stuff, um, and in Southern California, same thing. Uh, you have news deserts, so lacking trained journalists who can at least tell you what's happening on a day to day basis, what's going on in City Hall. You have this void of information, and frankly, that could have have uh, one, you don't have any information to work with uh, what's happening in your community, and two, you know what happens to critical thinking if you don't have any information to to process the news or process what's happening in your community. So um, I, I, I wanna 
you know, invite my panelists to, to comment on this, but speaking, to, I think the New York Times is going to be okay. The New York Times has 3.5 million paid subscribers. They're an information elite. I think they made really good business bets. Um, an information elite will always pay however many hundreds of dollars for the information the New York Times provides. And the fact that they have like great journalists, including Adam, um, in their stable. But, you know, the, that is not the, the big issue we're dealing with here because the New York Times audience is still relatively small when you see that the, the vast, that this is, America is a big country. And, you know, it's like, I remember one time I was in South Carolina and not many people actually still would, would read the New York Times. I remember this is a, it happens to be amusing. I was in South Carolina and um, I went to a corner store and said, do you know where I can get the New York Times? And the, this um, man who was sitting outside looked at me and says, New York. Right. So, but I would love my uh, my fellow panelists to comment on the fact that we 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 you know we talk about the curse what what has happened in the last four years and um, the blows the media have taken. But what we what we haven't really addressed is the fact that we have a crisis of personnel who can actually cover the news and and save their communities in a way that you know, traditionally for the last, before, before the cuts for the last 40, 50 years, that was happening on a regular basis. Not only a crisis of personnel to cover the news, but I think there's a, a real gap in terms of the people who are consumers of um, news. And, and I say that because there, was a huge gap, a huge lack of sort of the old civics that we used to know when we were in school, you know, learning about democracy and the role of democracy and the role of free speech and the role of government and the role of the three branches. And I think that's been sort of um, eroding over the years. So people, there, there, there's a swath of people who don't really understand sort of the foundations of this democracy. And when you add that to people who don't necessarily read, um, who won't access New York Times or the Washington Post, those few um, bastions of the fourth estate that still pour resources into news gathering. Um, you know, when you add to that the lack of local newspapers, um, are local newspapers who have any ability to, to bring in national news. And then you, you add the fact that we, we are um, a country where we're sort of in this echo chamber where, you know, you listen to MSNBC or you listen to Fox and you, you know, you're not, you're kind of reinforcing what you, think you know, and not really hearing the diaspora of ideas, you, you end up with um, an electorate, I think, that is very sort of um, not, what I'm trying to say is they're, they're not really kind of seeing the whole picture. They're seeing the picture that they want to see or the picture that they've been exposed to and not looking more broadly, listening more broadly, reading more broadly to kind of understand the dynamics going on in the country. Right. So I want to come back to, I want to come back to, to a question that is related to Jerry's point, which is, so how can we better educate citizens to examine the credibility of sources of information to make the choices that are in their best interest, uh, which is, uh, you know, what we would call the democratic way of life. Um, so what is the answer? Or maybe it's several answers. I mean, I guess I, I would say, is that the role of journalists? I mean, I think our role is to report and to provide context. I'm not exactly sure our role is to educate and I would just have a counterpoint to what my colleagues have suggested. I have only worked in television. Um, 
my, you know, since getting out of, since even before leaving college. COVID has created a real opportunity. I am making more programs now than I've ever made before. And it's largely because the COVID has cut so much of commercial television production that PBS has come to us. We've had two series to launch, two new programs to launch during the COVID period. And they've both been picked up for the next period for second seasons. Um, one was picked up before it even debuted, it had been picked up for additional episodes. So uh, yes, I am optimistic, but I'm also recognizing that there's an opportunity amid the chaos of this moment that we at the PBS NewsHour has, have been able to maximize and take advantage of because there is this desperate need for programming. I especially think um, in the TV context, because so many more people are at home, they want to go someplace different. And one of the great things about television is that it can take you to places that you can't get yourself. And so I think there's been a real opportunity for us to really push things. Um, I just want to follow up to, and not to, I mean, I, I think as journalists, it's not my job to educate an audience. My job is to inform them. And I think if I can do that well, I really want to rely on someone else to do the educating part. But I wanted to pick up something um, that Adam had mentioned, and it's, it's really about when we used to go to stories, and, and I am slightly defending the ability to go someplace, and I was posted overseas for seven years. I've you know, been to every country in the Middle East. There's some gift to be able to go someplace and find the essence to a story and to be able to report it. But back at that point, if you ended up somewhere, the likelihood there wouldn't be other people tweeting there wouldn't be websites from the locals, you know, telling you this is happening as well. People could, they had to rely on your version or your version, CBS's version, the New York Times version. Like there were only a few of us out there able to share this is the reality at that, at, as we see it. The fact that there are more people locally tweeting and doing all of those things it makes, in my mind, it makes the folks working with me have to work that much more harder to find really good sources, to find really good characters, to really get to the essence. And I see it as a professional challenge and it doesn't in any way depress me because I do think it's such a great skill to be able to parachute into some place and shine a very different light. The light that I shine, if the light that my reporters shine on a story is gonna be a very different light than the ones um, a local Twitter person shines on a story. I think they're both valid and very useful. And I think they both have their different, um, you know, their, their different sort of goals, but I think we need both. And I don't think, um, I, I, I don't know what to say about the hollowing out of newsrooms. Do we have fewer people at the news hour? We do, but we've also, our digital teams like doubled since I arrived. And I think that's great. You know, I think you've just made a very uh, important point about where journalism is today. And that is, uh, very different from where it was just 30 years ago, uh, in, in that a journalist today does the first word, the fastest word, the final word, the future word, and of course, we hope the most factual word, does all of those things at the same time. Journalist today does long-form journalism, tweets, um, does graphics, uh, does broadcast, uh, print, all of the above. Uh, which was unthinkable in a day when there was a divide between the Associated Press and, say, the New Yorker. Today, it's all mixed up. Um, and some people would say the journalist today has a skill set like none of 
the predecessors um, had because the world that we're in, the technology that we have enables us as journalists to do things we couldn't do before. So that's a rather encouraging message I think I'm hearing from Jane. Um, the, the bigger question, I guess, is um, one of how do we protect ourselves against bias and um, mistakes and, uh, you know, the, the clash between what we would consider news and entertainment. Since, James, you come out of broadcast, uh, as you just said, and so much of broadcast is about entertainment, less about perspective and context. I don't know if I agree with that. And certainly I actually don't agree with that. Um, I think you can really learn things uh, and, and there are valuable lessons in things that could, that can be entertaining. Um, and so I think it's really all in how you shape it. I've been very lucky to work with some icons of the industry, um, you know, Brian Gumbel, Katie Couric, Tom Brokaw, Ted Koppel, and now, you know, Gwen Eiffel and now um, Judy Woodruff. And they all want to have, they want to be able to make points, but they also want to be able to engage people in what it is they are trying to convey. And I do think it is necessary at times to make that fun or to make that entertaining. I, I don't think there's anything, and to make it engaging. I think if we, you know, think about the moments in your life that you can just on, on one hand, think about these are some of the best moments in our lives. A lot of that includes laughing. A lot of that sometimes includes crying. A lot of that sometimes includes like emotional moments and the extent to which we as uh, storytellers are able to capture some of those elements in what it is we're doing as a way to convey ideas to the people we're trying to reach. I think that's a good thing. So let's take it a little step further. Um, which is the company that we haven't mentioned so far, uh, which has somehow incurred the wrath, not only of news organizations, but also Democrats and Republicans alike, and that would be Facebook. Um, to what extent is Facebook getting in the way of uh, news? I'm not sure it's fair to say that Facebook is getting in the way of news. Um, we, you know, traditional journalists have their issues with Facebook um, because it lets all kinds of information in. Um, there are questions about how the information is being used, how Facebook is being manipulated by the Russians and others, um, how fake news is not always recognized, not always um, pointed out, not always taken offline. But Facebook in its purest form is just a platform and it's the, it's the bad actors. I, I'm not sure that Facebook is the bad actor. It's, it's all the others who are using Facebook in ways that maybe Facebook never even expected to be used and misused, and it falls to an informed um, user base to kind of put social media in its place and know how to use it best so that they don't get caught up in the disinformation and the misinformation. I know there are a lot who would disagree and see Facebook as the, the bad actor, but I kind of think it's just being used like a lot of the media is being used. I think I agree mostly uh, with Jerry here, um, uh, but I'd actually go, I think a little further and say, I'm uh, equally concerned by um, 
them exercise it by Facebook and social media companies generally exercising judgment over um, what should spread and what shouldn't spread. And now Facebook, I think, has been better than other platforms about this by engaging um, with some partisan and, uh, you know, like the Daily Caller, uh, I believe. And um, when I was at the Weekly Standard, the Weekly Standard had a contract uh, with Facebook to fact check um, stories that were spreading that were like a lot of them were just simply baseless. And so if we would mark, you know, this story um, is false, uh, they would throttle the, the traffic. So they wouldn't make it that you couldn't post it any longer, but they would make it that it, it wouldn't show up on your, uh, your friends' feeds or um, it wouldn't trend or wouldn't rate in, uh, in their algorithm. So I think Facebook, you know, it's really up against, um, it's, it's up against a lot here, um, but the majority of things shared on Facebook, um, they're like baby photos. They're, um, it's not, um, you know, simply a, a purveyor of, of Russian propaganda, um, though, you know, the Russians and the Iranians and the Chinese and um, all sorts of uh, foreign governments use it to influence, uh, in, influence people. Um, so I, I think it's, um, it would be too simple to say that um, Facebook is um, bad. I mean, it's also, it's also connected um, a lots of people to much more information that's true. So um, I, I think, you know, they can always do better, but um, I don't think it's this demon um, that it's been made out to be. I just want to add one point about Facebook. Devon, I'm sorry if you want to say something, yeah, yeah. but um, using Facebook as a commissioning entity, we were able to pilot two programs. Okay, and so I think that's one of the challenges in um, journalism where I sit, how do you experiment? So we experimented on Facebook. We, they decided they wanted to create you know, and curate TV videos and whatever. And so we said, okay, we think we can make some for you. So we did one series and it was a very small, like five episode series and it went pretty well. And, you know, some of them, you know, got millions of views. These were all sort of journalistically sound, but they were done in a way that you might watch it on Facebook. The next step, we decided uh, they wanted to do a weekly series. And so we came up with a weekly interview show called That Moment When which was really about talking to people who really sort of gave us like a critical moment in their lives where there was some pivot, you know, turning point or whatever. That show, the highest rated episode of that show became the basis for one of the series I just spoke about that just got commissioned this year by PBS and now it's about to have a second run. So we effectively used the Facebook platform to test ideas and to experiment to come up with things that would work within the larger PBS context. I think in my mind, that was a wonderful way of using a platform to try to experiment because that's really, think about the ways and how limited it is to experiment in our main platforms. It's very, very difficult. And Facebook gave us that space. Matt, I would like to uh, pro provide the other side of this, um, if you don't mind. Yeah, please do. All yeah, have I was going to ask that question. <laughs> we all have a great, we could all, you know, uh, have a, a good Facebook story. But the fact is that Facebook has, you know, enormous power, that Facebook's platform has been used to deny the Holocaust. Facebook, Facebook's um, platform has been used to, you know, in some acts of genocide, I'm thinking about Myanmar and some other things here. Facebook has a uh, platform has been used to, to change elections and to spread a vast amount of misinformation and disinformation around the world, right? And I don't for a minute believe that Facebook exists to connect people. I believe that Facebook exists to make Mark Zuckerberg rich and his investors richer, right? So I think we gotta, I mean, Facebook is, Facebook's algorithms are not neutral things. When they change your algorithm, there's something 
there's something driving that. It may be some tra traffic is going to some places that they don't like. Um, people who built their, like newspapers, for example, or news sites, people who built their business on, um, or businesses on Facebook, they know what it, is, what, what it is like to depend on Facebook for any kind of goodwill or not. So, you know, I, I just, the fact is that even for the last year, Mark Zuckerberg knowing, you know, the, the might of Facebook in moving information around the world, he has put front, I mean, full page ads everywhere that he can to say, yes, I support regulation. Now he's not supporting regulation because he's doing such a good job. He understands, and all of the, the, his co-founders who, I mean, who actually have left the company, um, including the folks at Instagram, they know that Facebook has lost its way and it's time for Facebook to be reined in. So, you know, I, and I would just follow up on what Devon has said. There was a uh, major piece in the Atlantic uh, not too long ago, and I just, want to share a couple sentences from that piece, which is the real, I'm quoting now, the real game is simply that Russian operatives created pages that reached people organically, as the saying goes. Jonathan Albright, research director of the Toe Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia University, pulled data on the six publicly known Russia-linked Facebook pages. He found that their posts had been shared 340 million times. And those were six of 470 pages that Facebook has linked to Russian operatives. Um, so that's billions of shares, uh, in other words, and that speaks to uh, Devon's point. Um, I think what we wanna do now is try to get to answer something that I think our um, listeners, viewers have been asking about if the sources of information have become irrevocably partisan, how do we achieve some kind of shared reality? Um, is that possible? So I spend a lot of time, um, you know, working with and talking to funders, talking to our stakeholders. The very interesting thing about the news, our audience, it is about a third uh, Republican, a third Democratic, and the remainder are independents. Um, we are consistently rated the most trusted news organization of them all. Uh, and I think what we take very seriously is the need for balance, and it's not false equivalency, but really trying to make sure we have perspectives that are valid on um, you know, a range of issues. Tonight's show, we did an interview with the acting domestic policy advisor at the White House. We followed that interview up with, an inter with uh, the mayor of Chicago, both talking about COVID and the stimulus package, but from two di very, different, um, very different points of view. And I think the way we bring more people in is that we figure out ways that we're eating from the same buffet. And, you know, we are very lucky. Our audience has grown during the COVID period. Our digital audience is growing. I know Adam thinks he may be one of the few people in his generation who actually watches, but um, to, to give an example, Shields and Brooks is our number one podcast. And we have 40 million digital users over the course a month from all of our digital pages. That's not 80 year olds. I'm sure it's some, but it's a lot of their children and their grandkids. And so finding a way for people to eat from the same buffet, and even if it starts very simply with a single download of Shields and Brooks, or on Mondays we have um, you know, Politics Monday, I think that's the way we start in knitting things back together such that there is sort of this sort of common information, this sort of shared sense of this is the world and the real challenge is not what reality is, but how do we approach it? How do we try to find solutions, recognizing that these are the problems? James, do you see that happening anywhere else other than NPR? 
Well, no, I'm with PBS. I think it is possibly happening with NPR, but I think, um, you know, and, and again, I'm gonna name some publications but, and maybe these don't really fit and they are elite, but, you know, obviously The Economist, The New Yorker, um, The New York Review of Books. Again, they are all, you know, very, very specific, but they do all sort of strive for accuracy. I mean, when I used to be a young reporter in Washington, I used to get the DC edition of the LA Times. It was perfect because it always gave you stories that none of my friends and colleagues reading the East Coast newspapers would ever be able to find. And it got me to California a lot. So I don't know, I think I, 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 it's very difficult and I'll be honest, I'm, a bit, I'm very focused and a bit selfish. I'm really focused on PBS and PBS NewsHour. And I think we have, um, working with my executive producer, Sarah Just and Judy, I think we have figured out some of the things that are working for us. And we're just trying to do more of that. But we are encouraged that both liberal people and conservative people and moderates and independents feel as though they can trust us. And I think in that there is hope that by presenting a set of common facts that is balanced and accurate and um, at times interesting and entertaining, people can get what they need to help them be informed and make the decisions that they need to make. Forgive me for saying NPR instead of PBS, but um, my, my fear, my question, I guess, is, is it happening? Is that um, feeding, what did you call it? Feeding from the same source? Or <laughs> is, is it happening anywhere else? Because it just seems, especially in the, the digital and broadcast media, that it remains very segmented. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I think it is segmented. But, you know, I also don't work in commercial media anymore. I, 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 you know, I, by design, work in public media. And I think, in a way, I may not be as well equipped to have this conversation because in public media, part of our goal is to be of service to the public. And we, don't, we think that we cannot do that unless we are serving our users and customers and viewers in the ways that not only resonate with them, but speak to their truths. And so I can't really, I, I don't know, look, I, have I worked in commercial TV? Yes, but I don't know what those pressures are like at the moment, um, but I know those are very different pressures than the ones that we face at the news hour. So we have a uh, question from Peter Rutkoff, the distinguished professor and really the creator of the American Studies uh, program at Kenyon, and uh, in so many ways did so much for diversity at Kenyon. He asks, with so many voices, our culture seems to be more democratic, yet with so many voices, not anyone commonly agreed on as a voice. Are we getting more fragmented? And he follows that up with uh, Russian operatives on Facebook, an indictment of Facebook or a tribute to the effectiveness of Russian information operations. Who wants that one? Um, I would just uh, suggest, I mean, I know people look back at like the era of Murrow and Cronkite as like we had these authoritative figures, but I'm not so sure that um, that's ever going to be the case again. And I'm not sure it was necessarily the case then. Uh, I wasn't there, um, but uh, so others can, can speak to that. Um, but uh, I think we have a, uh, a segmented media. I think it's the, the inputs um, required for great enterprise journalism now cost a fortune. And there's one revenue stream, subscribers. And you don't want to piss off your subscribers, excuse me. You don't want to uh, annoy your subscribers such that they, um, they stop subscribing. Um, it's sort of a, a survival thing. Um, so I guess that, um, 
that that addresses, I think, both Peter's point and uh, what we were discussing before. And I think and the, I now have to. Facebook, yeah, go ahead, Jerry. Go ahead. I was Jerry. just going to say on the Facebook issue. You know, I think Facebook is really complicated, and one of the best things I've seen about it actually was sort of. Uh, I think it's called a pseudo documentary called The Social Dilemma, but it talks a lot about um, the algorithms, how Facebook and other so social media companies manipulate and are doing all that they can to get all the information about you because the individual is really the product that they're selling. And it's kind of a scary um, look at how social media uh, is feels like it's not subject to the ethics that we have traditionally considered important to our democracy. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to Peter's question, but it goes back to what Devon was saying that, you know, maybe there's some culpability on Facebook's part here in the way that they are um, changing the face of news in not so positive ways that the platform, the platform is the platform, but the platform might also have some insidious inklings there. So I just want to say I was corrected. The question about the Russian operatives did not come from Professor Rutkoff, came from someone else. So that's just for the record. Okay. Um, is there a follow-up on this point from any of you? Look, I worked in television where there were, you know, the three nightly anchors, and um, I did a project with um, Peter Jennings in Kosovo. I, I, I mean, I think it was great that they could, with the decision of you know, their decision and the decision of their producers focus world attention on an event. And now that's much harder to do. So for an example, um, when I first got to London, uh, very shortly afterwards, uh, Princess Diana died. And then, you know, it was just, that was like a, a huge story, obviously. And I was a young foreign reporter. And then um, like a week later, Mother Teresa died. And, you know, there's this whole sort of question, like, should we go cover Mother Teresa's funeral? And really it was the sense was, well, we've just spent all of this moment with Princess Diana. And so of course I ended up going to Calcutta and reporting on um, the funeral of Mother Teresa. And that was really because there was a sort of game of chicken. As soon as one anchor decided he wanted to go, the others followed and is that good or bad? I'm not exactly sure, but I think in today's world, it's much more, um, it's much less regimented in that way. And as producers, we can decide, you know, do we want Judy to go here or do we not want her to go there? And it's not as, um, it's not as regimented. And I think there's more variety in what people are getting as a result. That's a wonderful I, I segue I to- a little bit. I'm sorry, Jerry. Uh, I was Go just ahead. saying, I, I guess I disagree with James a little bit. I think the herd mentality is still alive and well in, in journalism and in news coverage. I think people tend to go where they think the story is, um, where others have gone. I think the lessons of the last decade, though, have, um, have taught us that we have, uh, you know, finite resources and we, we have to use it wisely. So, um, you know, speaking from experience, it's like, you know, when I was managing editor, we, I wanted to cover every story um, there was around the world. And, you know, as resources got more scarce, I, we had to take our, take our, uh, um, you know, take our, our best shots at the stories that we think our readers would be most um, interested in. Um, rather than cover everything. And I think as to, as since this word started this session, um, as uh, the media have gotten more segmented, you, you find like, for example, you would know what a PBS story is versus a 
NBC story for that matter. And you might say, okay, you know, PBS is going, but you know, do we, do we have to go because it, this is, this story is right smack in who they think or we think their audience is. Um, so I, I find top editors making, make, um, making more decisions like that because of the finite resources in frankly, almost all newsrooms. So speaking of resources, I think uh, I am uh, beholden to our clock and I have to say that the time has come, the walrus said, to return to Professor Rowe if he will take care of business for us. All right, well, uh, thank you, Matt. And, and let me begin first by, by thanking all of the panelists, Jerry, Devon, James, and Adam. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us tonight. We uh, really appreciate uh, all, all that you've had to say and especially the time that you took. That's uh, where I speak on behalf of myself and I think on, on behalf of the audience. We are deeply grateful. For, for what you have done. And in particular, there are a couple of things that, that, that you know, for me at least, I think are gonna be really important. One is, is that the need to reestablish what we could call journalistic trust or public trust in journalism so that journalism can address and hold the public trust. And a lot of that will really start locally, right? I think that's one of the things that, that came out, you know, if, you know, having reporters who uh, are both trusted within and can be voices of or for the local community is a really important way to start. But I think also one of the things that we've seen too is the way in which business incentives are changing uh, in ways that make that kind of reporting much more difficult. Um, uh, that it's not clear the degree to which business incentives and new technology platforms you know, cleanly align with what our needs are for information as a democracy. And I think that is going to continue to be a very substantial challenge that we face now and into the future. And finally, uh, there's a whole long list, but I'll just mention one more. But I am heartened by the hope that James has, has expressed in the ability of public journalism to continue to uh, help meet the, the needs of our democracy. And so uh, the message isn't one of just simply unremitting change of, of, of the media environment in ways that make life more democratically difficult for us. Um, and so we face a number of challenges, but I'm hoping that after this evening that we as, as your audience understand those challenges better, and I'm sure that we do. Um, and uh, I thank the audience for the time that they devoted to our discussion tonight. This is a very important topic uh, and uh, these are uh, momentous times. And so thank you audience for your willingness to engage with us this evening as well. Finally, before we leave, let me remind everyone that our next panel in this series, America Voted, What Next? will be two weeks from tonight on November 10th at 7 p.m. Uh, we will take stock of where the vote count stands, if it is not already known, what it tells us about this moment in American history, and begin to consider what our future as a democracy might hold. I hope that you can make it then as well. And if you are among the millions of people who have not already cast your ballot in this election, uh, I urge you please to make sure that you vote. American democracy depends on it. With that, I thank you, I thank you all, and I wish you all a very good day.